Good morning. Welcome to our class this morning. We're continuing our process of understanding the secret of the Christian spiritual life. And this is lesson 41. And then next hour will be 42. Uh, in the spiritual warfare designations, this is 16A. And uh, we're currently looking at the human nature, the human nature that we all inherited from Adam, the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, human good and human evil, human bad. So our sinful nature, or the, what I call the inherited human nature from Adam, the uh, Adamic nature that has both human good for the survival of the species and human bad uh, for the non-survival of the species, uh, the way we identify. So the Enneagram is excellent in that it points out both. It doesn't do so from a biblical uh, perspective. It does it from a human perspective, but it, uh, it talks about the good qualities that each of our personalities have. And then it talks about the bad uh, aspects of each personality. Uh, we're going to see those coming up uh, probably next week. Uh, we'll see the, uh, the degradation process for each type, how we go from, from a good human being uh, to a psychopathic human being in each of the uh, nine types. It's a nine step process that we go through and you'll recognize people, mostly you'll recognize serial killers and, and other criminals when they get into the lower end of the uh, degradation process. But you'll also get to see yourself uh, and get to see, oh, I didn't realize that that was in me. And uh, you will find out that there are, uh, if you already haven't, find out that there are things in your uh, human nature that, that surprise you and shock you, much like Paul in Romans chapter 7. That which works its way out of me surprises me. Uh, I do not understand it. So we're going to cover those uh, coming up. Then uh, we're going to cover common everyday kind of clues as to what type you are. Most of you probably already know. Today's subtypes will help uh, cement that for you. Uh, but uh, so you can tell with other people uh, what they are. And uh, so uh, without having to uh, memorize everything involved with a certain type, without having to memorize every aspect of a two or a four or a six or an eight, uh, or you just have the basics so that the things in the conversation with them or the way they act, the things that they uh, do that are public or, or at least obvious in a public setting. So you can identify that and uh, identify their type and uh, perhaps even uh, what will be easier for you, you'll be able to recognize their subtype. I've been toying with the idea that you might be able to respond to people based on uh, recognizing their subtype as well as you could with their type, because the subtype is uh, how they're going to really uh, interact with individuals and the world. And uh, uh, I'm thinking that maybe that might be as important uh, as knowing the type. So let's go ahead and begin with the word of prayer and we'll get into our uh, didactic section then. Father Yahoo, we are grateful for the opportunity to uh, understand ourselves better, see ourselves as you have seen us, but now we want to see ourselves as you see us in Christ. So in that process, we have to eliminate. We have to walk by means of the spirit. We have to put off the uh, old nature, put off the old man. And in this study, uh, we hope to see our old man so that we might better put it off and put on the new man in Christ Jesus. So as we study these things, we ask that you keep it relevant to us in our spiritual walk and not turn it into some psychological exercise. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we concluded with the centers, the passions or emotions, and the human survival instincts. This week, we'll put them together to learn our subtypes and how they influence our personalities. So first, let's review. 
Uh, these are the passions. These are the passions, and uh, you'll see that uh, they use the seven deadly sins. Uh, they don't use uh, the list of sins from Galatians, for example, or, or compile a list from Ephesians or Colossians. Uh, they, they use the seven deadly sins uh, from Psalms, or is that Proverbs? Um, uh, Psalms, and, uh, and then they add two others. For the three and the six, they add self-deceit, and for the six, fear. Uh, and uh, I think they did that because uh, fear is such a uh, huge component in every type. Every, everyone has a fear and deal with fear in different ways. And everyone has some self-deceit, so I think they figured they should put that in. I don't necessarily see that, but at least uh, uh, in their passions, their list of passions or emotions, uh, sins, they have uh, nine that uh, play into it. We're not going to utilize those much when we get to our actual spiritual walk section. Uh, we're going to actually use Galatians and Ephesians and Corinthians and Romans and, and uh, Philemon. We'll do use every biblical reference for categorizing sinful, the sinful nature. Um, so we have the passions. Then we have the centers. Uh, did I like a, oh yeah, the centers. So here are the centers. You have the heart center. That's types two, three, and four. The head center or the, the thinking center, five, six, and seven. And then you have the body or gut center. Those are the eight, nines, and ones. So in our diagram here, uh, where it says heart emo emotions, let me see if I can get that to right here, heart emotions, uh, you can think of that as your emotional center. And the emotional aspect of your brain. Then when you get over here to the head or thought center, that's your thinking a little hard to write upside down here. Thinking, that's your cogitating, your analysis, uh, your an an analyzing center. And then when you get up to the eight, nine, and one, they call that the body or instinct center. Uh, I refer to it as the gut because that fits our way of thinking of gut instincts. Uh, uh, follow your gut or uh, I went with my gut on that, or I, 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 all of this information, yeah, I see all of that, but, but my gut tells me this, uh, and that's the way the eight, nine, and one works. They've got that inner gut feeling about the way things ought to be, and uh, that's how they uh, deal with, uh, with life. Now we're going to jump into next, then the... Now let's go ahead and stay with uh, heart. Two, three, and four. This is obvious to our Western concept, thinking of heart. It's emotional. In the, in the Bible, the heart is not the emotions. In the, in the Bible, the heart is, is the doing aspect of your soul, the, what, where, where you have made a decision and own it. We could call it the own it center. I... I know these things, but I own this. This is the real me. And uh, uh, so the Bible heart is different from the Enneagram heart. Enneagram heart is more the uh, concept of emotions. Uh, these three types, two, three, and four, tend to be emotional at their core. In other words, the first way they're going to react is emotionally. They live in the amygdala center of the brain, I'm going to give you that diagram here for a second. Okay, here, here's the frontal lobe. Here's the amygdala. The amygdala is the emotional center. And then, and then here's the hindbrain or the medulla. 
the hind brain back here that will that will cover predominantly the locus ceruleus area of that brain. Okay, so let's go back to here. So heart two, three, and four, they're in that emotional uh, center, the amygdala. The head type or uh, the frontal lobe type, these types are wrapped up in their thinking or the frontal lobes of their brain. Rationality is their go-to core. They will analyze everything and make a decision based on their analysis. So where the, where the heart center uh, makes their decisions based on the emotion, and, and you'll oftentimes hear people who are a heart center talk about this. I feel that this is right. Uh, I, I have a feeling. They're more of a feeling kind of uh, response. The head people uh, will, uh, will respond more with, with the rationality type of rationale type of explanations for how they, how they believe it. Uh, it makes sense to me, okay? That's a, a common phrase with the head type. So heart type, I feel it, head type, it makes sense. Uh, then when we get uh, back to the uh, body type, the eight, nine, and one, this group governs their life by their gut, what we call gut instincts. They live in the posterior regions of the brain, the locus ceruleus, in the medulla oblongata, the brain stem. The major connection to the peripheral, peripheral and enteric organ nervous systems. Uh, enteric is the key here. Uh, if you ever want to, if you want to learn something that doesn't sound like it would make any sense, but has a, enough scientific evidence to prove it, uh, look at the uh, uh, connection, the brain, the brain body connection, and uh, do a little study on that. Uh, they can change uh, emotions, change the way people uh, feel by doing uh, what they call fecal. Uh, transplants. Uh, the FDA has just approved the first fecal capsule for human uh, ingestion, uh, taking it uh, by mouth, uh, and uh, it's designed, the primary use will be in the treatment of depression, as uh, what they're using it for, because they found that fecal transplants will help depression. Uh, in lab animals, it'll also help anxiety and fear and other things. They haven't got to that point to approve it for that, I think, I don't think in humans yet, but they are uh, getting ready to start introducing fecal capsules in uh, depressed patients. So that's body or gut, and there's a huge connection between your stomach your small intestine, stomach, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine with your brain. So what goes on with the microbes? And this is all about microbes. Like 90 plus, plus percent of your fecal matter are microbes, okay? We, we always... Uh, tend to think that that's all food. No, it's not. Uh, it's mostly just microbes and uh, just some, some fiber from the food. So this is the connection and it's from back here down to the, that's why uh, it goes down to the enteric system. Um, you get uh, disturbing news and, and it affects your gut. It affects your enteric system, it affects your stomach, it affects your small intestine, your large intestine. Uh, fear, uh, the, the, the most obvious one, uh, fear and uh, urinating uh, is very common, uh, but uh, uh, my, my stomach's all in a knot in a, uh, in a situation. Uh, that's, that's the brain body connection, very real, very, uh, uh, the uh, scriptures do talk about it uh, in uh, limited fashion. 
and uh, but it is in the scriptures uh, but also science has made this discovery and there it's big right now it's it's huge uh, new books coming out about it all the time new research being done uh, all over the world and new treatment methods being developed because of it so that's the the gut feeling uh, the gut instinct section uh, that the eight nines and one uh, live in decide from they just know that it's right okay if you know an eight or you know a nine or you know a one you'll know uh, that they know what's right that's why i've said you know the eight wants to fix what's not right the nine is a good mediator uh, in right and wrong because they know what's right and they can help people come to good decisions like a judge or a marriage counselor the one knows what's right and is uh, is uh, obsessed with what is right and wanting everything to be right so those are the that's the gut hopefully that's clear enough now that we can move on from there and go uh, from our diagrams back into our text okay Oh, there it is. I put it. I put the slide in, so you would have the slide as well. These three centers are essentially hereditary or from pre-birth development. Uh, your brain develops, of course, uh, in uh, utero, and there are chemical things that go on, and so you uh, inherit the neurochemicals from the mother. Uh, you inherit, it appears, some uh, aspect of the brain from the human father. And uh, then during the process of the chemical washes and things that take place uh, in utero, the, uh, the baby in developing will have their centers magnified. Uh, we all have all three centers, of course, you don't, unless you have brain damage, uh, you have all three, but uh, one is uh, typically uh, significantly dominant over the others, uh, especially uh, in interactions with people. Uh, I saw a lady the other day that when I was telling her about something, she teared up. Uh, she started, she started to cry. Uh, wasn't, it wasn't anything sad uh it was emotional and she teared up so immediately i knew that she was a heart center and that gave me gave me clues into other aspects of her uh type and uh, will help me in in relating to her these are the grand masters of our personality types as described in the enneagram Next, we have the three basic human survival instincts, self-preservation, personal safety and security, social or tribal, belonging to a group for nurture and safety, sexual or what's called the intimate one-to-one. -one. That's for procreation, of course, in the sexual and for close friendships for security. You know, who are you going to call if you have a problem? You're going to call your best friend. Um, if you need advice, who are you going to call? Your best friend. Uh, you're not going to put it out for a large group unless you're uh, now a social media junkie and you want to uh, share everything with the world. Uh, so those are the three. They're, they're instincts throughout human history and uh, are, of course, there are other instincts, but these are the three primary uh, that are for human survival and we all live in them in one way or another. Let's go ahead and see the three. Self-preservation, social, sexual. And you see there's overlap um, of the three in their diagram. And that's because there is some overlap. We're not all one. Uh, we are a combination of the three with one dominant. There's, I gave you that slide. When your center, center is what? Heart, 
head, gut, and your passion. What are they? The nine uh, sinful patterns and basic sinful patterns and extrapolate to all sinful patterns. Uh, when uh, your center, your instinct, self-preservation, social or sexual, and your passion, the nine uh, basic sins of the Enneagram, uh, we'll have about 40 of them uh, in our study. Uh, but when they combine together into what I call the Baptist casserole, uh, uh, your type is further refined and, de and defined. They, those things mix together and they come up with, a, with an aspect of your personality that is more focused in an area. These are identified in the Enneagram as subtypes. So when these come together, that's what the subtype is. Subtypes, uh, this is an introduction from Beatrice Chestnut. Hmm. This might not be the way it is in your notes. Uh, this might be, your notes may well have Rizzo and Hudson's uh, instincts first. We'll go ahead and if it's not that way in your notes, go ahead to the three uh, instincts, uh, the subtypes introduction by Beatrice Chestnut. Uh, we'll cover the Rizzo and Hudson aspects of them uh, as a review later then, if that's the case. I thought I had uh, repaired this, this slide thing. Uh, someone sent me a, a chat and uh, let me know if this is the way your notes are or not. And I'll fix that at halftime. Okay, so let's go ahead with it so I don't spend uh, several minutes pulling up the other, uh, the other presentation. The three instincts are animal drives. These three instincts operate in all of us, but usually only one is dominant. Okay. Only one is dominant in each individual. And when the powerful biological drive of that dominant instinct, instinct is put into, in service of the passion, it fuels a more specific expression of the personality. Notice that she just puts it in uh, with the passion, uh, not uh, so much with the center. I do, I, I think it's more both. Uh, when it's put in service of the passion, it fuels a more specific expression of the personality, resulting in a more nuanced character, a subtype of the main personality type. Uh, okay, so I did, okay, you're, we're good, we're good. I left that, uh, that one page introduction uh, by uh, Beatrice Chestnut before going into the Rizzo Hudson. Okay, we're fine. Uh, Rizzo Hudson are the authors of some books on the Enneagram. They're uh, some of the chief authors, as is Beatrice uh, Chestnut. Uh, Rizzo Hudson say this about self-preservation. The focus here is easy to understand from the name. People of this instinctual type are preoccupied with basic survival needs as they translate in our contemporary society. Thus, self-preservation types are not so concerned with uh, self-defense, though nowadays more and more so again, uh, but they're more concerned with money, food, housing, health, physical safety, and comfort. Uh, being safe and physically comfortable are priorities. These people uh, are quick to notice any problems in a room, such as poor lighting or uncomfortable chairs, or to be dissatisfied with the room temperature. They are acutely aware of their immediate environment. That's part of their self-preservation uh, in, in certain cultures, certain uh, areas. Things are very important for physical safety. So those are the people that are gonna be extremely aware of their surroundings from a safety perspective. In our modern uh, Western society, uh, we're going to be more aware of these things like uh, the lighting, the chair comfort, uh, room temperature, those kind of things. Uh, 
because we don't feel the danger that some societies do uh, unless you're out and about. They often have issues connected with food and drink, maybe good issues or bad issues. Uh, Beatrice Chestnut, for example, says even though she is a two, which is a server, helper, friendship person, that, that she finds herself thinking about uh, after breakfast, she's thinking about what am I going to have for lunch, okay? thinking about food. So if you, if you are thinking about uh, what food you're going to have, what you're going to have for supper uh, tends to uh, come up a lot in your thinking, uh, you might be a self-preservation. Um, they often have issues connected with food and drink, either overdoing it or having strict dietary requirements in the healthy to average levels of the three instinctual types, they are the most practical in the sense of taking care of basic life necessities, paying your bills, maintaining the home and the workplace, acquiring useful skills and so on, okay? Uh, people who uh, do not have this self-preservation instinct, one of the clues is their bills pile up because to them, that's not a priority. Uh, they have either a uh, social or one-to-one -one dominance in theirs. So that's, that's how you can tell who has self-preservation uh, with these little clues like this. When these types deteriorate, they tend to distort the instinct to the degree that they are poor at taking care of themselves. Unhealthy self-preservation types eat and sleep poorly or become obsessed with health issues. They often have difficulty handling money and may act out in deliberately self-destructive ways. In a nutshell, no matter what Enneagram personality type is involved, self-preservation subtypes are focused on enhancing their personal security and physical comfort. The social, the social instinct. This variant, notice uh, Rizzo Hudson call it a variant. I think, think they're one of the group that calls wings subtypes, so they call this a variant, but this is a subtype. The social, the social, uh, sub, uh, social instinct is focused on their interactions with other people and with the sense of value or esteem they derive from their participation in collective activities. These include work, their work, uh, environment, family, hobbies, clubs, basically any arena in which social types can interact with others for some shared purpose. This is the group orientation, social. The instinct underlying this behavior was an important one in human survival. Human beings on their own are rather weak, vulnerable creatures and easily fall prey to a frequently hostile environment. By learning to live and work together, our ancestors created the safety necessary for human beings not only to survive, but to thrive. Within that social instinct, however, are many other implicit imperatives. The primary among them is the understanding of place or position within a hierarchical social structure. Uh, these are the people that where, where the self-preservation is going to take their personal safety in hand, okay? They're gonna have, uh, they're gonna have uh, weapons, personal uh, weapons available to protect themselves. The social is going to be more involved with uh, thinking that, that the society is going to protect them, that, that I'll trust that the police are going to be able to help me. Uh, so we see how that works. This is as true for dogs and gorillas as it is for human beings. Thus the desire for attention, recognition, honor, success, fame, leadership, appreciation, and the safety of belonging can all be seen as manifestations of the social instinct. So what do you see in that group? Attention, recognition, honor, success, fame, leadership, appreciation. Sounds like a three, sounds like a two, sounds like a four, right? Uh, that's, those are all uh, heart, heart centers. 
So if they have a heart center and a social instinct, uh, then they're going to be magnified in those types. Social types like to know what is going on around them, want to make some kind of contribution to the human enterprise. There is often an interest in the events and activities of one's own culture, sometimes of another culture. In general, social types enjoy interacting with people in, in groups, uh, but they avoid intimacy. In their imbalanced, unhealthy forms, these types can become profoundly antisocial, detesting people and resenting their society or having poorly developed social skills. So you can see the spectrum of social types. In a nutshell, no matter what Enneagram personality type is involved, those are the nine types, the social uh, instinct types are focused on interacting with people in ways that will build their personal value, their sense of accomplishment, and their security of place or position with others. Okay, now we move to the sexual. I call this one-to-one, -one, intimate relationships, close relationships. All of those are part of it. Uh, sexual because the initial drive, of course, uh, for, uh, for human basic instincts is procreation. So that's how that became, that name became attached to this particular instinctual drive. Many people originally ident identify themselves as this type, uh, perhaps confusing the idea of a sexual instinct type with being a sexy person. Many people think, ah, sexual instinctual type, sexy, that's what I want to be. Of course, sexiness uh, is in the eye of the beholder, and there are plenty of sexy people in all three of the instinctual types. Furthermore, lest one think this type more glamorous than the other two, one would do well to remember that the instinct can become distorted in the type, leading to the area of life causing the greatest problems. In the healthy to average sexual types, there's a desire for intensity of experience, not just sexual experience, but in any activity having a similar charge, excitement, uh, uh, brain chemical stimulation. This intensity could be found in a great conversation or an exciting movie. Much has been said about this type preferring one-on-one -on -one relationships versus social types preference for larger groups. But a quick poll of one's acquaintances will reveal that almost all people prefer communicating one-on-one -on -one, one, rather than an, in a group. Uh, I find uh, that a, that's not as true as uh, Rizzo Hudson make it sound. Uh, this, I think, is Don Rizzo's uh, writing here. Uh, he makes it sound like uh, that this is just absolutely true. I, I don't find it that way. Uh, the one-on-one uh, -on -one type, uh, more not, not social, not public speakers generally, not uh, good in groups, not the kind that comes into a group situation and starts off by telling jokes or stories. They're the kind that will gravitate to someone sitting in a corner and uh, go talk with that person. The question is more one of intensity of contact and the strength of the desire for intimacy. Sexual types are the intimacy junks, junkies uh, of the instinctual, instinctual types, often neglecting pressing obligations or even basic maintenance if they are swept up in someone or something that has captivated them. This gives a wide ranging exploratory approach to life, but also a lack of focus on one's own priorities. In their neurotic forms, this type can manifest with a wandering lack of focus, sexual promiscuity, and acting out, or just the opposite, in a fearful, dysfunctional attitude towards sex and intimacy. Sexual types, however, will be intense even about their avoidances. In conclusion, no matter what Enneagram personality type is involved, the sexual instincts 
are focused on having intense, intimate interactions and experiences with others and with the environment to give them a powerful sense of aliveness. I recommend you go back through this Rizzo Hudson section and where he says sexual types, you, you cross out the word type and put instincts, okay? I think it's confusing to mix types from the basic nine types with the instincts uh, and call them types. I think it will confuse you. I, I thought about changing it in the text uh, or putting it in brackets, but I thought, no, this is what uh, they say. So I'm gonna leave it the same and just uh, give you a caveat at the end that, you, that when, when Rizzo Hudson say sexual types, social types, self-preservation types, know that they're talking about instincts, not the nine types, okay? All right, now, now we're back to discussion from Chestnut and another prominent author, uh, often considered to be the Christian wing of Enneagram uh, teachers, uh, Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr has a lot of non-biblical teachings in his uh, solutions to Enneagram described problems. Uh, so we will not be using his information for any of that. In fact, we won't even be doing any human viewpoint uh, description of answers to human problems, uh, I'm leaving those out. I gave you a little sample of some of the Enneagram tendency toward error last week, uh, but I'm not going to give human good development psychological teaching related to the Enneagram because we're gonna use biblical teaching rather than, than human viewpoint teaching. Okay, so this is uh, Beatrice Chestnut, and I'll also do Richard Rohr. Uh, this is Beatrice's introduction to the three types to give you a comparison with the Rizzo Hudson. So uh, Beatrice Chestnut says it this way, the self-preservation instinct focuses attention on and shapes behavior around issues related to survival and material security. It generally directs energy towards safety and security concerns, including have enough resources, avoiding danger and maintaining a basic sense of structure and well-being. Uh, this is probably uh, uh, prototypically uh, manifested in women and their nest, a, a self-preservation uh, female uh, instinct will be very concerned about the the condition of their home, uh, their sense of structure in the home. Uh, they're the ones that clean uh, a lot, do a lot of house cleaning, housekeeping, can't go to bed if there's a dirty dish by the sink. Uh, uh, very concerned about their, their nest or their home. Uh, it generally uh, directs energy towards safety and security concerns, including having enough resources, avoiding danger and maintaining a basic sense of structure and well-being. Beyond these basic concerns, the self-preservation instinct may place emphasis on other areas of security in terms of whatever that means for a person of a specific type, Enneagram type, once it mixes with one of the nine passions, okay? Each Enneagram type, has a passion or a, an emotional uh, structure and uh, uh, a sinful uh, expression of their passions. And uh, so all of that goes together and we'll, uh, Beatrice Chestnut does a good job of describing how that works. So we'll see that more as we go on. The social from Beatrice Chestnut, 
The social instinct, instinct focuses attention on and shapes behavior around issues related to belonging, recognition, and relationships in social groups. It drives us to get along with the herd, our family, the community, and the groups we belong to, okay? So you see an immediate difference between the two, and these are fairly easy to pick up uh, when you have, when you see a person that uh, is very much about belonging, recognition, and relationships, then they're probably not a self-preservation type. They're probably a social type, especially when that relates to family and community and groups. Uh, if you have if you have a person that belongs to nine nine different clubs, okay, they're probably uh, driven dominantly by the social instinct. Okay. This I don't know where that nine came from. This instinct also relates to how much power or standing one has relative to the other members of the group in terms of whatever that might mean for a person of a specific type. The sexual instinct from Beatrice, Ro uh, Beatrice Chestnut. The sexual instinct focuses on attention on and shapes behavior around issues related to the quality and status of relationships with specific individuals, not groups sometimes referred to as the one-to-one -one instinct. It generally directs energy toward the achievement and maintenance of sexual connections. Interpersonal attraction and bonding. Best friends, what do they call it? Uh, BFFs, okay? A lot of that with the, with the sexual one-to-one -one, uh, intimacy instinct. This is instinct, seeks a sense of well-being through one-to-one -one connections with people in terms of whatever that means to the person for, uh, means for a person of that specific type. Subtypes exist within each of the nine types, broken down into three distinct versions according to how the passion of each type combines with one of the three instinctual biases or goals that all social creatures share directed either towards self-preservation, social interaction, or sexual or one-to-one -one bonding. When the passion and the dominant instinctual drive come together, they create an even more specific focus of attention, reflecting a particular insatiable need that drives behavior. These subtypes thus reflect three different subsets of the patterns of the nine types that provide even more specificity in describing the human personality. And that's, uh, that's the conclusion I came to that you can, that it's easier to pick out a person's subtype uh, uh, because you can see their instincts in the subtype. And instincts are easier to pick out uh, because there's only three of them instead of the nine different personality types. But those subtypes will help you to help lead you to their actual personality type or their any a type, as some authors call it. For each of the nine types, there is a counter type subtype. Okay, I'm going to get a little more, a little more uh, uh, complicated. Uh, you have three types. self-preservation, sexual, or social. One will be dominant. Two will be what we'll call normal. Three will be the counter. This is the one, the counter type is the one that is neglected and one that is sometimes very counter uh, counter type to uh, the person, okay? So let's see what she says about that. In every case with each of the nine points of the Enneagram, there are two subtypes that go with the flow of the energy of the passion. And there's one that is upside down. That's what she calls the counter type. 
uh, one, uh, the counter passional type is called the counter type of the three subtypes. For example, the counterphobic sexual six is the most well known of the counter types. It's a six who is unafraid. Six is basically their basic uh, passion is fear, right? So if their basic passion is fear, then uh, when they are a sexual subtype, they will be, that'll be their counter type, and they will be apparently unafraid. Now, really, they are, but they will make themselves appear unafraid. The passion of the six is fear, but the sexual subtype goes against fear by being strong and intimidating as a way of coping with fear. Okay, so just as a little illustration, if you have a, a sexual subtype six, they uh, could be, I'm not saying that they will be, but they are more prone to be the type that is dominant in a marriage relationship or a, a uh, male-female relationship. These, these can be the type that when they go downhill, when they deteriorate, can become abusers, spousal abusers, okay? So that gives you a little like practical insight into a type and an instinct working together with the deterioration to create a bad person. Okay, we'll look at subtypes as described uh, by two prominent Enneagram authors, Beatrice Chestnut and Richard Rohr. Uh, Rohr doesn't uh, put in a lot of his false doctrine, well, any of his false doctrine in the uh, subtype. Uh, he mentions some simplified Christian stuff, nothing that I picked up on that was uh, anti-biblical uh, per se. So we'll look at them. Now you notice here in this introductory slide that you'll see right now that uh, Beatrice Chestnut is in regular type and Richard Rohr's name uh, and the RR in parentheses is italicized. That's how I break them down because I'm gonna give you Beatrice Chestnut first and then Richard Rohr second. And to keep them straight, I did the, italis the italics uh, so you can see which one I was talking, uh, which one I was quoting, okay? So, and then you see the BC in the parentheses, that's Beatrice Chestnut. Self-preservation one. This is type one with a self-preservation uh, instinct, okay? So she calls them a self-preservation one. What's their major major expression worry self-preservation ones are the true perfectionists of the three type ones three type ones self-preservation social sexual they express the passion of anger through working hard to make themselves and the things they do more perfect All right so remember what the what the passion of the one is is anger All right so they express their anger through working hard to make them think themselves and what they do more perfect. In this subtype, anger is the most repressed emotion. The defense mechanism of reaction formation transforms the heat of anger into warmth, resulting in a friendly and benevolent character. So you see, you could have a one that uh, is, is very friendly and kindly. Richard Rohr says it this way, self-preservation, self-preserving ones are anxious about succeeding. A single error could ruin everything. They feel that because of their imperfection, they have earned their failure, for imperfection is evil. Ones live in perpetual fear that they could make a mistake that could be ruinous. Because of this, when they speak, they tend to interrupt and correct themselves constantly. They're anxious people, they have anxiety. So you see the different, both of uh, Beatrice Chestnut and Richard Rohr, both describing self-preservation ones. 
but from a little different perspective, a little different perspective. How, how Beatrice Chestnut says that their, their anger expresses itself by making sure they do everything perfectly. The uh, roar approach is that, that they are anxious. And because of that, uh, they feel that they are not perfect because ones know that they're not perfect. And therefore they think that their imperfection is the reason that they fail and the reason that they might fail. So they're worried about it. They have anxiety. All right, Beatrice Chestnut on the social uh, one. Non-adaptability is her single term description. Social ones unconsciously consider themselves to be perfect. They express anger through focusing on being the perfect model of the right way to be. They have a teacher mentality that reflects an unconscious need for superiority. In the social one, anger is half hidden there's a transformation of the heat of anger into cold. This is a cooler intellectual personality type in which the main theme is control. So as we go along, you can, come, uh, when you review your notes, when you study uh, between now and next week, look at the difference between the self-preservation one, the social one, highlight the little differences and uh, make uh, make a note if you want if you have a one in your life make a note okay which way are they are they like the self-pres one or are they like the social one okay so you can see how they are and that will help you in in dealing with them richard Rohr says the social tub type one uh, is not prepared to identify themselves unconditionally with a social system that's defective. Remember, one's perfect. They want everything perfect. They can't quite fit with the, with the group because the group's not as perfect as either they think they are or as perfect as they think the group ought to be. Rather, they, rather they see their task as the constant reform of the system and they have a tendency to moralize, okay? They want to fix the society. They want to fix the group. They want to fix the club. Uh, they want to fix the family. They want to fix. At the same time, they are afraid that the people in charge might have something to reproach them with. This is the position of critical solidarity of Yes, but the ones, social ones have a problem with adapting to the group because of the perceived imperfection of the group. The sexual one, Beatrice Chestnut's one word description, zeal. And she identifies this as the counter type, as does Rohr. Counter types are pretty well uh, uniformly chosen, uh, selected. Okay, zeal, the sexual one, zeal. They're on fire, they're hot. Okay, uh, but this is the counter type for a one. So they're going to subvert or subdue uh, this nature. Sexual ones focusing, focus on perfecting others. They are more reformers than perfectionists. The only one who is explicitly angry, they act out anger through their intense desire to improve others and get what they want. They feel entitled in the way a reformer or a zealot uh, can feel entitled. They believe they have a right to change society and get what they want because they have a higher understanding of the truth and the reasons behind the right way to be. The counter type of the ones, they are more impulsive and outwardly angry. They go against the counter instinctive tendency of the one to repress anger and impulses. So the, the, the regular one represses their anger and, and diverts it into pursuing perfection. The sexual one 
nah, they're really well, willing to express the anger in their concepts, their ideas, their uh, ideal way of what is right and what want to be. So they become more of a reformer. They become more of uh, more like an eight, more of a crusader. Okay, they they uh, will not repress their anger. They will express their anger, but in the the one way. Okay, Richard Rohr says it this way: Sexual ones try to control their partners. Remember, this is sexual ones. That's the intimate relationships, the one-to-one -one relationships. They watch every step their partner takes and fear that others might be more attractive to their partner. See, they have an insecurity because they know what? They're not perfect. And that bugs, bugs them to death. Okay. They want to be perfect. They know they're not. So they worry about their one partner not being solidly attracted to them. Inside, they boil with jealousy and fear of loss, but are unable to admit and express this imperfect feeling. The jealousy comes from the fear that another could be more perfect and therefore more attractive. Sexual ones can extend this zeal to their cause also and be very hot-headed in their cause, as Paul was before his conversion breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, Acts 9.1. You see, this is not an individual who is receiving the, the brunt of jealousy and uh, anger, but this is the one who is doing it with their cause. I have the cause of whatever, whatever... Uh, it happens to be their club, their organization, uh, their uh, charity, whatever. They can become very hot-headed and obnoxious about it. They can't understand why nobody else is as, as uh, passionate about the plight of stray dogs or poor children or whatever their cause is, they can get really uh, excited and uh, emotional about it. And emotional for the one is angry and zeal. Okay. All right. I think we'll go ahead and stop here so that we don't take part of the type two uh, and their, their subtypes. Uh, and we'll uh, save those for next hour since we only have a little over a minute left for our first hour and we're doing pretty well. I, a little worried we're not going to finish. I'll probably try to stick more to the quotations and less to my descriptions or maybe the other way around. So let's uh, pray and we'll take a 10 minute break. Father Yahweh, we are grateful for uh, our look at our human nature. Uh, we're grateful that you have given us your word as a mirror to see ourselves once we understand ourselves, we can uh, better see ourselves in the mirror of the word so that my, we might not walk away unchanged, but changed by our putting off of our old man and the putting on of our new. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.